I trust you'll forgive me for teaching and preaching today, sitting down. Uh, all those things that Dr. Larson mentioned took a lot of years to accomplish. <laughs> so I've reached an age where it's, it just works better if I can sit down while teaching and preaching. Um, when I asked Dr. Larson if this would be okay, he said, well, our Lord taught sitting down. So that <laughs> seemed to me that like we have a good example as our Lord Jesus taught sitting down when he gave the Sermon on the Mount, for example. So I'm sure he taught standing up sometimes too. You have the outline before you. And uh, I realize that uh, your church, as a part of the denomination of the RCUS, turn it to put it down a little further. Okay. Yeah. A little farther. How's that going? Yeah, I think it's better. Good. I realize that uh, uh, as a church in the RCUS, your doctrinal standards are the three forms of unity. However, uh, I'm going to be focusing on the English Puritans who produced the Westminster Confession and Catechisms. And in the rear of your Trinity hymnal, you do have the Westminster Confession of Faith and also the Shorter Catechism. And I'll be making some references to that uh, in the various talks uh, today. So I wanted you to be aware of the uh, context of the people we're talking about. The year was 1603. Queen Elizabeth, we now have to say the first, had just died after the longest reign in British history, 45 years from 1558 to 1603. And since she never married, she had no heir to the throne other than the uh, son of her executed cousin, Mary, Queen of Scots, namely James VI of Scotland. He was journeying south from Scotland towards England to become King James I of England when he's met by a delegation of Puritans presenting him with what was called the millinery petition. Millinery has nothing to do with hats. It meant a thousand people had signed this petition for further reforms in the English church. The result was what was called the Hampton Court Conference. Uh, and the main uh, positive result of that conference was the production of the authorized version of the Bible, what we usually refer to as the King James Version, published in 1611. But otherwise, uh, James, who was about 37 years old then and had nagging health issues, he was uh, pleased to be leaving the somewhat colder climate of Scotland, but also leaving the badgering of Presbyterian elders, who were his advisors there in Scotland, where the Presbyterian church had been established from the days of John Knox. So uh, the result of this Hampton Court Conference, as I said, was the King James Version of the Bible, but little else to reform the church. James has said, Presbytery agreeeth as well with monarchy as God with the devil. I always enjoy the order there, Presbytery, monarchy, God, the devil. <laughs> but I don't think he intended that. No bishop, no king was his statement. Well, who were these Puritans anyway? They were churchmen who believed that the Reformation in England had not been allowed to go far enough. The course of the English Reformation can be reviewed by remembering the last four of the Tudor monarchs. Uh, and there's been a lot of publicity in Hollywood and on TV about these Tudor monarchs. So you're probably well familiar with uh, particularly Henry VIII, his father, Henry VII, had founded this dynasty of the Tudor monarchs after the civil wars called the Wars of the Roses. So there'd been a lot of turmoil. Henry VII was a very capable man who had uh, strengthened the monarchy and brought some unity 
uh, to England. Henry uh, broke from the Pope, you remember, in his effort to divorce his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, obviously Spanish, devoutly Catholic, and uh, he wanted to be sure that there'd be a male heir to sustain this dynasty, which where England had had such turmoil for a long time. Well, he had lived with Catherine long enough and they produced only one uh, child into living into adulthood who was a daughter. England had had only one time of a female ruler, Matilda, back in the 12th century and it had not worked. So everybody felt he needs a male heir to sustain this dynasty. Well, this was a rather dubious beginning for Protestantism in England a break from the Pope for such reasons, to have a divorce of his Spanish wife. And uh, it's the ideas of Luther and Calvin, however, were allowed into England. Most of all, English translations of the Bible were being produced. Henry was a typical Renaissance monarch. He, he was well-educated but it's questionable just where his own theology really was. And the things that he allowed in a Protestant direction were probably pretty much pragmatic and expedient for his rule. Public worship was transformed through the efforts of Archbishop Thomas Cranmer, a man who was gifted. Uh, remember, we're getting towards the age of Shakespeare. So a beautiful English language in the English Book of Common Prayer still reflects some of the uh, language of Thomas Cranmer. The desired male heir came through Henry's third wife, Jane Seymour, uh, in the person of Edward VI. Henry died in 1547 and Edward became king. He had been educated by devout Protestants, but he was only nine years old when he became king. And he was never very strong in health. Um, he was successful in promoting Protestantism throughout the realm. And one of the modern biographers of Edward makes the claim that Edward might have become the best king that England ever had if he had lived longer. But alas, uh, he died at age 15. But Protestantism had made great advances in his reign, 1547 to 1553. But when he died, then the monarchy reverted to that daughter of Henry and Catherine of Aragon, Mary Tudor, uh, 1553 to 58. She was an unhappy person, very frustrated. She was devoutly Catholic. She restored Roman Catholicism in England was reestablishing the relationship with the Pope, and uh, Protestant bishops were replaced. The mass, the mass, the Catholic mass was restored. And then in Parliament, the laws for burning heretics were revived. Those laws had existed back as early as the 1300s uh, to use against the Lollards, the followers of John Wycliffe those who were loyal to the Bible, but were viewed as heretics in late medieval England. They had been uh, abolished in the time of Edward VI. But now Mary and her parliament revives the laws for burning of heretics, and some 270 Protestants were burned at the stake during the reign of Mary Tudor. Hence, she's often known at that time as Bloody Mary. Um, Philip II of Spain, who was a militant Catholic, became Mary's husband, but no heir was produced. A fortunate thing for England. So when she died, her successor was the daughter of Henry's second wife, Anne Boleyn, namely Elizabeth. Elizabeth was viewed as illegitimate by the Pope. And he gave permission to English Catholics to seek her overthrow, even to assassinate her. 
She was committed to the survival of Anglicanism as a via media middle way and many who had gone into exile under Mary to the continent of Europe returned to push the Church of England closer to reformed churches in Switzerland, the Netherlands, and Germany. Protestantism made some progress, but once the Catholic threat was diminished by the defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588, Elizabeth presented, pre prevented more opposition uh, to bishops and to ritual, leaving the Anglican Church only half reformed, as the Puritan types claimed. And so these were the people who greeted James I as he came south from Scotland with that millinery petition. Under James, uh, who reigned 1603 to 1625, Pressure for conformity in worship caused some Puritans to go into exile in the Netherlands or over to America. Uh, the Separatist Pilgrims, for example, came to Massachusetts in 1620. That's towards the end of the reign of James I. The majority of Puritans stayed in the Church of England. Uh, people like William Perkins, uh, his dates are 1558 to 1602, an outstanding theologian and practical theologian as well, who had a great influence on the subsequent English Puritans. And then also William Ames. Sometimes you see a Latinized version of his name, Amicius, uh, 1576 to 1633. He was ejected from a faculty position at Cambridge, went to Holland, and uh, England uh, participated in the Synod of Dort, which produced the canons that are part of your three forms of unity, 1618 to 19. Uh, but James uh, restricted the preaching of predestination in England. So you get the, the feeling this new Stuart dynasty is really not favoring the Reformed theology. After James's death in 1625, his son Charles I became king, 1625 to 49. Charles was married to Henrietta Maria, the daughter of Henry IV of France. If you remember a little of your history from this time, uh, Henri Quatre, the Henry IV was the one who said, uh, Paris is worth a mass, and so he left his uh, reformed background converted to Catholicism in order to be accepted as king over a united France. Well, his daughter was the wife of Charles I. Charles appointed William Laud as Bishop of London in 1628 and then as Archbishop of Canterbury, the main leader of the Anglican Church, in 1633. And Laud reintroduced some Catholic forms of worship he was Arminian in doctrine, and so clearly the Puritan types, uh, consistent with Calvin's theology and practice, were in disfavor. His uh, persecution of the Puritan clergy led to John Winthrop going to America in 1630, eventually uh, accompanied by John Cotton, Thomas Hooker, and various others who are well known even in our day. Charles dissolved Parliament in 1629 and governed by personal rule until a war that broke out in Scotland called for new taxes. And so he had to call Parliament back into session in what becomes known as the Long Parliament in 1640. This Parliament was led by Puritans who eventually succeeded in actually having King Charles executed beheaded as a traitor in 1649. So we have the Long Parliament, which lasted from 1640 to 1649, where the Puritans were really dominant and in control. Oliver Cromwell is the great military leader of the Puritans in the wars, the civil wars with the Royalists, the Cavaliers uh, supporting Charles I, and the Westminster Assembly, which produces the Confession of Faith and the Catechisms, 
is held in this period of 1643 to 1648. A solemn league and covenant was made with Scotland. Uh, there were some Presbyterians who came down from Scotland to participate in the Westminster Assembly and produce these uh, great doctrinal statements of the confession, the larger and shorter catechisms, the Presbyterian form of church government, and a directory for worship, which have continued to be the standards for Presbyterian churches. And that had a lasting influence, not so much in England, but in Scotland and uh, America and Presbyterianism worldwide. Cromwell died in 1658. We'll have more to say about him in my final talk later today uh, in his relationship with John Owen particularly. But uh, the uh, Republican form of government dissolved. It broke up. And in 1660, Parliament was restored and the monarchy was restored in the person of Charles II a son of Charles I who had been in exile during the Puritan uh, dominance in the 1640s and 50s. The restoration of the Stuart dynasty in 1660 uh, was a reaction to the Puritan rule. And maybe in some ways the Puritan rule had been too strict and you could expect something of a reaction from people who weren't convinced of the same position. There was an act of uniformity passed in 1662 that meant everybody had to worship according to a revised book of, of uh, worship, of common worship in England, to which many of the Puritans had exceptions because some of the things by Bishop, Archbishop Laud in a Romanist direction were now included in that uh, book of common worship. And those who would not conform were ejected from their positions. It's a significant event in the history of the Church of England, what gets called the Great Ejection of 1662. It happened on St. Bartholomew's Day, August the 24th. That's a black letter day for us Protestants. The Huguenots were massacred in France on St. Bartholomew's Day in 1576. And now, uh, more than 2,000 ministers, about one-fifth of the parish clergy in the Church of England were ejected from their pulpits, not allowed to lead the churches anymore. And these were probably the most faithful of the Anglican ministers in both theology and practice. And there are scholars of the Church of England who still say today this was one of the big mistakes, one of the worst events for the Church of England itself this ejection of the Puritan types. The Clarendon Code, which was produced by uh, Charles II's cabinet, uh, included things like the Conventicle Act of 1664, which meant that there could be no gatherings of more than a small number. The Five Mile Act, that you could not meet any closer than five, uh, five miles from uh, the church. Uh, this involved uh, different forms of persecution of the nonconformists, people like Richard Baxter and John Bunyan, about whom we'll talk later today. John Owen also. So, uh, this was a terrible situation of persecution for the Puritan types. Uh, when Charles died, he secretly converted to Catholicism on his deathbed, probably showing where his true loyalties were. And then his brother, James II, who was devoutly Catholic, took the throne. He didn't last very long, 1685 to 88, because what's known as the Glorious Revolution of 1688 took place, establishing William of Orange and Mary as the new uh, monarchy in England. Uh, it was a uh, almost a bloodless war. Uh, William came from the Netherlands with ships to the southwestern part of England. Everybody yielded readily. Uh, James II, who was very unpopular, tried to escape across the channel. Some uh, lower bureaucrat recognized him and the other authority said, let him go, let him go. We don't want him here in England anymore. 
uh, we had to uh, behead his, his father. It's better if we just let him escape to the continent in exile. So uh, after the glorious revolution of 1688, which ushered in William and Mary, uh, Mary uh, continued to live till 1702. Uh, an act of toleration was produced in 1689 that protected nonconformists, and you find the Puritan energy going into these dissenting churches. Now, what were these Puritans really all about? There are various ways to define them, and scholars have had great difficulty. My feeling is, if you really want to know what they were about, you have to look at their piety. J.I. Packer, who's one of the great experts on the English Puritans, uh, spent his lifetime producing articles. He had promised to produce a book on the English Puritans, and it finally came out, really a collection of his uh, wonderful articles under the title, A Quest for Godliness. And I think if J.I. Packer views that as the way essentially to define the Puritans, that's the way we ought to try to understand them. And I want to give an example of pre-Puritan piety in the person of John Bradford. Uh, Dr. Larson mentioned this was my dissertation topic, and I'll probably say more than I should. <laughs> because I, I love this character. He's, uh, he's sometimes called the uh, first English Calvinist. Uh, he's called a pre-Puritan. And uh, to understand his authority, there's uh, a lot of help with alliteration. These uh, Tudor writers leading up to Shakespeare really knew how to use the English language. So I want to say uh, a little uh, alliteration here and his main two points of his piety begin with the letters A and S. The authority of scripture and assurance of salvation. Uh, assurance is really the pivot point in his piety. It's both the, the fruit of godly exercises in prayer and meditation in one's private life and the root of godly activity in one's public life. Assurance of salvation based on the authority of Scripture is really the way to understand the piety of this man who is imitated and followed in so many of the Puritans in subsequent time. There are four distinct concepts that lead to assurance. If you look at this outline, you can see the four repentance and faith, peace of conscience, the feeling of God's grace, and union with Christ. These are the internal part, the private Christian life of, of piety, and the backside of the sheet gives the results in the external activity of the Puritan's life. We'll come to describe these more. Repentance and faith, then. These involve a sorrow for sin and trust of pardon, both leading to conversion to a new life. There are five steps in both repentance and faith. They're sort of parallel each other. He says, when we talk about repentance, this is not something you can generate on your own. It's a gift of God's grace. Therefore, one begins with a prayer for God's gift. Then, secondly, one holds up the law of God, he says, as a mirror to toot in. Was a 16th century expression of looking at your reflection in the mirror and to see, including the, our Lord's spiritual interpretation of the law and the Sermon on the Mount, to get at the inner conviction of sin from the Ten Commandments. Then thirdly, you look at the penalty, or as he put it, the tag or curse uh, connected to God's law. Fourthly, examples in the Bible of God's judgment on those who have sinned. And then you ultimately meditate on the death of Christ. This is what our sin deserves. So this is a part of the internal meditation one is to employ. And the same then for faith. First of all, faith is not something we generate on our own. It's a gift of God's grace. So you pray that God would give you faith. 
And then just as you looked at the law, now you look at the gospel. You look at God's word of mercy, the promises of his grace in the gospel. And third, you look at the benefits of God's providence to you personally. As he says, be thankful that you were born not a dog or a toad <laughs> or a pagan or a Turk. <laughs> Instead, you were born in a Christian context as a man or a woman who can experience God's grace. And then look at the examples of God's love in the Bible. The mercy that our Savior showed to people in need of healing and of, of repentance is, is tender dealing with Peter after his denials. And ultimately, again, the death of Christ and the fact that death did not hold him, but he was risen again. So repentance and faith then depend on God's word, whether you're looking at law or gospel, and it's, it's something that is to be continually practiced to avoid hardening of heart on the one hand or despair on the other. And he realized that the psychology of people who were concerned about salvation could go either direction. One might get careless about one's life and a hardening of heart will develop if you don't continually look at the law of God. Or one can enter into despair. I'm surely lost, and we'll see an example of that in a moment, uh, if you don't keep looking at the promises of God in the gospel. And so peace of conscience, then, is the second part of this inner piety. Uh, he said there are two ways one can go. There's the overactive conscience, which is always entertaining doubts. Does God really love me or not? But then there's the sleepy conscience, which is insensitive to sin. In either case, he argues, conscience is not the final authority. Peace of conscience is important. When you're wrestling with these uh, two directions one might go, and the conscience that is what is God has built into us, a sense of right and wrong, uh, we need to realize that, as he says, the conscience is not the judge, but only the accuser. It's the word of God that is the judge. One of Bradford's correspondents, and by the way, he, we have about a hundred letters that he wrote from prison. I didn't go over his life for you in great detail, but uh, he was imprisoned for preaching contrary to license and causing a riot. And actually, he had done the opposite. Uh, he was present as, as one who was a recognized preacher in London as well as in his, he came from Manchester in the north of England and had preached effectively in Lancashire and uh, also in Cambridge. But uh, when Mary restored the Catholic bishops and so forth, one of them was on a platform outside St. Paul's in London and the people were about to riot against him. Somebody even threw a dagger that pinned his cloak to the pillar. And Bradford was on the platform. He got up and began to preach to them from Romans 13, saying, don't do this. We must let the new powers uh, be in civil control and wait and see what God will do. But he was arrested for that. Uh, most of the Protestant leaders who were arrested and tried were arrested because they had married. Uh, of course, the Catholic, they had been Catholic priests before the Reformation had taken hold, and that had reverted to the, the rule in Mary's time. Bradford never married, so they couldn't arrest him on that score. But he was imprisoned, and during the time, he, they, by a sad mistake, they put him in the same cell in the tower with Archbishop Thomas Cranmer, Hugh Latimer, the great preacher of the English Reformation, and Bishop Nicholas Ridley, who had been Bishop of London and also Bradford Superior at Cambridge when he was studying theology there. And he helped give them backbone and spine in preparation for Latimer and Ridley's uh, debates with the Catholics at Oxford before they got burned at the stake. And poor Cranmer, who recanted, and then when he was burned to the stake, saying, this hand that signed that recantation shall burn first. And reaffirmed his faith at the end. At any rate, while he was in prison, he wrote some hundred letters of, of spiritual counsel to people outside. 
uh, in London and surrounding territory trying to maintain their Protestant faith. And uh, one of the correspondents was a, a woman in her 20s at the time, Mistress Mary Honeywood. And she was one who suffered depression and kept questioning her whether she was among the elect and so forth. And Bradford gave her this counsel that uh, your conscience is not the final judge. The word of God is the final judge. The conscience may be the accuser, but you must listen to the word of God. It's interesting that much later when John Fox was putting together what we know as Fox's Book of Martyrs, in which Bradford's letters appear, um, and he became one of the real heroes. Uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs was, uh, along with the Bible, the, one of the things in all, every Puritan household. But uh, Fox went to interview Mistress Mary Honeywood later on to learn more about what she knew of Bradford and these other martyrs who were burned at the stake. And uh, she was still suffering doubts. And she had a goblet in her hand and said, I'm as surely damned as this glass is broken. Threw it down on the floor and it bounced right back up into her hand. <laughs> you can be sure John Fox applied the lesson <laughs> as a result. But Radford says that the strife that we experience in our Christian life is actually uh, evidence of our being among the elect. If we were not among the elect, Satan wouldn't worry about us. <laughs> but the strife is typical of between the old man and the new man, between the flesh and the spirit. This conflict is a proof that we are indeed among God's elect. And so you have recourse to the law to keep the old man from carnal carelessness, another bit of alliteration again, and the gospel to keep the new man from despair. This way, then, he says, you can come to a feeling of God's grace. Now, one of Bradford's early associates who was converted for, through Latimer's preaching about the same time was a man named Thomas Sampson. And we have some of Sampson's words about Bradford who kept a spiritual journal. Some say this was the Puritan substitute for the old Catholic confessional, that they kept a kind of spiritual diary. And he said Bradford would often, he'd observe as he would write things in his diary, get to the actual point of tears. So Bradford said feeling can be helpful. But at the same time, uh, one is to believe and obey because of God's word, whether it produces feeling or not. And then here's one of these nice alliterative statements. First must faith go before and then feeling will follow. Notice all those F's there. Good memory device. And ultimately, what we want to experience is union with Christ. It's interesting as Bradford, he was in prison, arrested in, in the summer of 1553 when Mary had come into power. And then the laws for burning of heretics, it took time for Parliament to restore those laws, to revive them in the early part of 1555. His trial was held in January of 1555. And then there, because he was a popular preacher, they, the authorities tried every kind of good cop, bad cop approach to get him to recant his Protestant faith. They brought Spanish friars, his old friends, various people who had been loyal to the Catholic position. Bradford stood firm. But as you get towards the end, you say, well, uh, here's this hero of the faith. Was he really going that easily to martyrdom? In his last letters, he always has at the top, Jesus Emmanuel. Jesus, God with us, strengthening him in the face of the ultimate persecution. Finally, when they take him, they had to switch him from prison to prison at the last minute because they knew a popular crowd would come. He is burned at the stake with a young uh, working man, John Leaf, and he says, Master Leaf, we shall enjoy a happy summer. But he felt that he was being put to death with Christ, Jesus Emmanuel.
His union with Christ was the ultimate strength in his piety. Now it's very interesting now as we switch to the external activity of piety, uh, how this assurance of salvation was the pivot point. He was strengthened in eter in internally by the word of God, law and gospel, and so forth. But this enabled him then externally to obey God's purposes. He had disputes in the prison with a group known as the Free Willers. These were other people, maybe more in the Anabaptist uh, circle that had been arrested under Mary's regime. And people always marvel, why are you having these theological debates when you're all going to be put to death? But the Free Willers felt that assurance actually led to a careless and worldly life. And Bradford was saying to them, quite the contrary. It's doubt and insecurity that leads to weakness and to compromise with evil. So his point is that one, by having assurance internally, then it leads you to obedience to God. He advised people not to go to Mass. Uh, the first commandment, he says, that we must have no other gods but only God. That's the internal uh, faith that you have. But there's a second command. Thou shalt not make any graven images. You must worship God the way he commands. And so he actually wrote a document, a treatise called The Hurt of Hearing Mass and said to the people trying to be faithful to Christ under Mary's regime, <clears throat> if you're going to go, you must confront the idolatry that exists in the Mass. He saw discipline as one of the marks of the true church. Uh, Luther had said it's word and sacraments. Uh, Calvin similarly in the Institutes, however, in his response to Cardinal Sadoletto, Calvin does include the exercise of discipline. So you have these marks and the uh, Puritans following Bradford felt there, there is to be discipline. And he also has an explicit following of the fourth commandment regarding the Sabbath. And that came to characterize the Puritans as well. He was also what was known as a commonwealth man. Uh, Hugh Latimer, the great preacher of the Reformation, had uh, joined a, or assembled a group of people known as the commonwealth men who were concerned for social justice in England. Um, Martin Bootser, who was... Uh, uh, had come from Strasbourg. He was the great reformer in, on the continent with whom Calvin had uh, learned in, in exile from Geneva. And uh, at the invitation of Thomas Cranmer, uh, Martin Bootser and Peter Martyr Vermigli had come to England to teach at Cambridge, Bootser, and at Oxford, Vermigli. And Bradford was uh, taught uh, by Bootser at Cambridge. And Bootser was one interested in the application of Christianity socially. He actually wrote a treatise called De Regno Christi, dedicated to King Edward VI on the kingdom of Christ. How is this young king to rule uh, as the, the new Josiah in England? And so uh, Bradford had absorbed these principles also of uh, uh, application of Christianity in the public life. And then finally, Love in action is the ultimate expression of our Christian ethic. The free willers had disputed with him in the prison and they complained. He became sort of the treasurer of the funds that were given. You had to support yourself when you were in a Tudor prison. So they were reliant on the Christians outside to give them what they needed for food and clothing and so forth. And the free willers felt they weren't getting their fair share. And Bradford made a big point of sending them an excessive gift to show the love among the fellow believers. He said, though in some things we agree not, yet let love bear the bell away. Let love triumph over all else. So to sum up then, Bradford's piety, which we'll find echoed in the later Puritans, is founded on the grace of God at every point. It moves from the word to the mind 
to the emotions, and finally to action, with assurance being the pivot point between the inner spiritual life and the external activity of the Christian. So this is the kind of piety that came to characterize the English Puritans, as we'll see in those who produced the Westminster Confession and Catechisms, and in such memorable Puritans as Richard Baxter, John Owen, and John Bunyan, whom we'll consider later today. We'll stop there.